Thank you for the introduction and of course thank you for uh, Park uh, Systems and all the uh, hard work of the organizers. And most of all, thank you for uh, staying this Friday. I know a three-day conference is quite long and uh, especially on the last day, uh, it's a special effort to stay. So I'm with Case Western Reserve University in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, and today, today I'm going to talk about nanostructuring films by templating and uh, pattern surfaces. So uh, to begin with, uh, Case Western Reserve University, uh, we are located uh, in Ohio. In a nice summer day, it looks like this, but I would not invite you to visit in winter. Uh, it's as uh, white as snow. But uh, in uh, Cleveland, we are at the University Circle. There's a lot of uh, culture there. We have the Cleveland Museum of Art, the uh, Cleveland Orchestra. Uh, we are near uh, Lake Erie. And so uh, this is a really nice place to be. However, there are some things you need to know about Case Westerns. For example, how many of you have seen the movie Air Force One? Uh, this movie, uh, at the beginning, and you can look at YouTube, but later. Uh, the beginning of the movie, the night scene was actually taken at the rooftop of the home of the Cleveland Orchestra at Severance Hall. Uh, how many of you have seen the movie Captain America Winter Soldier? So at the middle of the movie, you'll see a very expansive uh, headquarters of S.H.I.E.L.D. That scene was actually taken inside the Cleveland Museum of Art. So it just tells you how big that museum is. So it's Case Western Reserve University, but otherwise we call it the Hollywood of Ohio. So um, it's uh, also historic in that the first American Nobel Prize winner, uh, Professor uh, Morley, was actually a professor there. And even the founder of Dow Chemicals, Henry Dow, was a graduate of Case Western Reserve uh, University. Uh, I'm with the Macromolecular Science Engineering Department, and uh, I'm at the fifth floor of this building. This is my group. Uh, most of the work that I'm going to talk to you was done by Charlie um, and also a past student, um, uh, Briley, uh, too, who is doing a postdoc to UC Berkeley. Now, my area of research is at the chemistry of interfaces, so I very much appreciate the talk of Professor DeFeyer there, so I, I really want uh, uh, to congratulate him for that nice work, uh, patterning and uh, using um, STM very uh, um, rationally and very uh, well designed to do that chemistry. But in this case, we extend the chemistry more towards polymerization. Uh, for example, we graph polymers and surfaces, we uh, make functional dendrimers and at the same time do patterning. Um, I'm the editor-in-chief of MRS Communication, so I'd, I'd, I'd like to take this time to invite you to uh, uh, my journal. And uh, we are uh, interested in review articles, but also short communication letters. I promise about two to three weeks of review. Um, and these days, we do a lot of 3D uh, uh, printing in my group, where we focus on new materials that can be uh, 3D printed using uh, various types of printing modes uh, and nanocomposites as well. Okay, so today I'm going to talk more about polymers. What you, of course, uh, have seen um, over the last uh, three days is a, a very good use of surface probe microscopy to order polymers. I like to use this illustration because it clearly shows that a polymer is a true nanomaterial that stretches, that uh, is confined, can be confined on surfaces that can be ordered or it can be part of a colloidal dispersion, pickering emulsion, and therefore has the ability to control its physical properties by the uh, type or design you put in on a macromolecule. However, today I'm going to focus on how we have used uh, interfaces, and in particular ultra-thin films, to do this type of ordering. So when we look at a coating or a material, with a barrier layer, let's say one to 100 nanometer, we sometimes think of it as simply a coating material that prevents the uh, bulk uh, or protects the bulk from the interaction with the environment. However, it is really a two-way street in that it is also a way of protecting the environment from the bulk material. So with that type of uh, transposition or looking at the uh, effect of both the environment and the bulk material, you can do a lot of interesting um, design 
and functionality. So for example, in many types of commercial applications, whether you're dealing with uh, surfaces that prevent wetting or packaging, you need to pay attention to diffusion, uh, transport properties, different types of uh, uh, interaction with stimuli responsive systems and so on. Now, if you carry this to the nanostructure level, you are talking obviously about multi-layer systems. Uh, and uh, as shown earlier, this type of self-assembly or even directed assembly allows you to make these ultra-thin films uh, either by chemisorption or physisorption or during by langmuir blodgett films or polyelectrolytes. And uh, uh, the other panel shows that we have actually looked at a number of systems based on electropolymerization on patterns and also the growth of polymer brushes. Uh, in fact, my group is very much uh, oriented in chemistry in the past, but these days a lot of it is related to engineering surfaces. Uh, so for example, in the past we've synthesized a lot of uh, uh, photovoltaic LED uh, polymer materials with uh, specific energy transfer and charge transfer relationships when it is properly self-assembled. Or the look, uh, the use of dendrimer systems uh, that includes uh, nanoparticles as core or the ability to control that chain uh, charge transfer, electron transfer between a nanoparticle, uh, it could be a plasmonic or a uh, light emitting nanoparticle and a specifically designed dendron or branch system. Uh, so actually we synthesized one of the first polythiophene dendrimers and observed that we can order this on interfaces just like what you've seen earlier in that we can use a highly ordered pyrolytic graphite to position the uh, different types of dendrimers based on the ratio of the alkyl chain and the size of the core uh, to produce different lattice structures or to enable the stacking of these dendrimers to form nanowires. More recently, we've been playing with supramolecular chemistry where we template the polymerization of catenanes or trefoil knots uh, using the uh, uh, core as a template macro initiator and then expanding the ring uh, using, let's say, uh, ring opening polymerization such as polycaprolactone. What you actually see here is an AFM image of the first trefoil knot ever reported for a polycaprolactone that was designed from a phenantrolene complex resulting from uh, a bidentate type of uh, uh, interaction between phenantrolines resulting in this molecule. Now, if you think this is the story, I'm just beginning. Um, I'm going to talk to you about five different systems that we have done in the lab to demonstrate that interfaces are very functional, very functional, very application oriented in that you can use this chemistry uh, in order to build in specific uh, functionalities that have uh, high potential for applications. But otherwise, my quiz to you, anyway, I'm a professor, is that I want you to look at the, these materials in terms of classifying it as fake materials. I know some of you watch fake news, but why not fake materials, okay? So throughout the rest of my talk, watch out for the fake enzyme the fake nanoparticle, and the fake leaf. So all of these are fake materials. So let's start with the first fake. Let's look at an enzyme, a uh, model of a receptor that allows specific enzyme interaction, uh, fit-induced model, or uh, rate model. In fact, the size of a dendrimer up to the fourth or fifth generation, let's say polyamidoamine, tracks the size of most well-known enzymes um, that uh, you see in literature or even study like cytochrome or hemoglobin. However, uh, as you've seen yesterday, the functionality of enzymes is critical to survival or living in that one mistake or one defect can cause diseases. And so uh, in the function of enzyme, it has to be site and chemical specific. Now we have a principle in polymerization called molecular imprinting, which is a lock and key model in that a chemical analyte becomes a 
key without a lock. That is, can we synthesize plastic enzymes, quote unquote, based on molecular imprinting? The answer is yes. In fact, that study has been about 30 to 40 years old in the making. So in a um, molecular imprinting approach, you start with an analyte, which is your template. You surround it with monomers, cross-link it, and then finally you end up with cavities that are very specific for your original template. And so you have this cavity that mimics that of an enzyme, but more stable in the fact that it was built from ground up by non-covalent interactions. So about seven, eight years ago, we reported the use of electrochemistry to produce molecularly imprinted sites on a polymer film that can be used for sensing. The design is such that we look at this as a sort of a pseudo dendrimer in that the core of your analyte can be surrounded by monofunctional or bifunctional monomers that are electrochemically active. When I say electrochemically active, uh, they can be in the form of uh, anodic polymerization to form, let's say, a conducting polymer like polythiophene or polycarbazole or um, other types of uh, conjugated polymers. We then deposited this, for example, on a gold surface, which also serves as a working electrode, uh, enabling us to do electrochemistry or even surface plasmon resonance spectroscopy. So one of our first reports involved the analysis of different drugs, paracetamol, caffeine, and what you can see here, for example, in caffeine and theophylline, theobromine, have almost similar structures. So the question is, can this method where we complex the template with a third thiophene monomer and then polymerize them to form electro-polymerized uh, polythiophene on an SPR surface allow us to distinguish these molecules. One of the key things we did was we did a lot of ab initio uh, semi-empirical methods to find the optimized interaction between the monomer and the template. So for example, in an optimized system, we, we can have a two to one, three to one ratio of the monomers and the template. And with this, we were able to prove that this type of interaction is critical. So the result was when we templated um, different molecules from theophylline to paracetamol to naproxen, the rest did not bind. It is very selective. In fact, theophylline, which uh, the structure is quite similar to caffeine and theobromine, had very poor performance. So in other words, these are very selective, very sensitive systems. And uh, we've not only done this on an SPR chip, but we've done it on a quartz crystal microbalance. The molecule at that time, we looked at folic acid, a known nutraceutical, and we did the same thing and optimized the system. Since then, we've done it on molecules like sarin, TNT, dopamine, uh, morphine, and so on. Sarin, if you'd recognize, is a nerve agent that kills. Uh, no, we did not use real sarin. I don't want dead graduate students. So I use a fake sarin, okay, or an analog. No, we did not use TNT. Otherwise, we would have had explosions in our lab. So I had to use DNT. But the principle is the same. They all work very well. Okay, so let me switch to the second system. The second system involved grafting and templating polymer brushes and combination with polyelectrolyte multilayers enable us to make different types of stimuli responsive systems. Uh, so in fact, a lot of these things we did way back in 2006 involved living anionic, living free radical polymerization, grafting on particle surface and flat surface surfaces or the use of polyelectrolyte multilayers to control the grafting density. Uh, so a lot of this work we did in the past, uh, and was a very popular uh, field uh, back then, uh, multilayer polyelectrolytes, where we combined the stimuli responsiveness of a weak PL polyelectrolyte and a LCSD behavior, let's say, of a polynipan brush. More recently, we use this chemistry to mimic that of a lotus leaf. And some of you are familiar with the lotus leaf effect 
in that water does not easily wet this surface, not because of the chemistry only, but because of the Cassie-Baxter phenomena. The Cassie-Baxter phenomena is where you have trapped air together with the hierarchy of roughness or features preventing a complete wetting of the surface. So what we did is we copied the lotus leaf using a polydimethyl siloxane mold. So we took this mold uh, from a PDM imp uh, impression and then molded, uh, the, used the mold to stamp a uh, cellulose acetate surface. That is a surface which we then grafted macro initiators for ATRP and then grew polynipan brush. And you'll see why we did that. We wanted to have a stimuli responsive wetting behavior as a function of temperature. So how does it look? Well, uh, in this case, uh, forgive me, I did not use SPM, uh, SPM but rather uh, SEM. You have the first impression after grafting the initiator and then after grafting the polymers, you'll see a big difference between that of a grafted polymer fake lotus leaf versus the original. Now we had to use a technique like IR imaging to confirm the presence of all the species and polymers that I mentioned, including the polymer brush, the uh, cellulose acetate, and so on. So what's nice with IR imaging is we got both topographical and spectroscopic image over the optical uh, image or uh, resolution that we have. In fact, IR AFM is one of the uh, most promising techniques that one can do this at the uh, AFM resolution. So just to show that it works, here we have the wetting on a flat surface that was not uh, uh, functionalized with a lotus leaf pattern. And you can see here, when we heat it up to 40 degrees C, it becomes hydrophobic. So polynipam is an LCST behavior behaving polymer or lower critical solution temperature behaving polymer at 37 degrees C. So when you heat it up, it becomes hydrophobic and when you cool it down to room temperature, it becomes hydrophilic. So no surprise here. However, when we use the pattern surface, we got a super hydrophobic behavior, we know because it's above 150 degrees in contact angle and then a super wetting behavior below the LCST. So this difference in a matter of shifting 15 degrees Celsius in temperature gets you a very high super wetting to super hydrophobic behavior. And moreover, this is cyclic repeatable. So these are fake lotus leaf, but smart lotus leaves. Um, let me skip this part here uh, uh, where we, uh, we actually use the, uh, the same method to make bilayers that are ori origami-like folding structures and I can reserve that for another talk or another discussion. But let me go ahead and go to the third example. So in the case of electro nanopatterning and conjugated polymers, um, our early contribution to that was the synthesis of precursor polymers that then cross-link at interfaces by using electrochemistry, uh, where the polymer backbone can be a conjugated polymer or a non-conjugated polymer. Of course, in one extreme, if you zip this along the backbone, you get a lighter polymer, but we never almost observed that. What we have is basically a thermoset, where the cross-linking produces a very hard film, or rather a, a hard-to-remove film on surfaces, let's say, of ITO or gold. In fact, we use this to modify the surface of light-emitting diode devices where we change the work function uh, 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 by changing the doping properties of the cross-link polyvinyl carbazole, resulting in a tunable LED device performance. However, a general utility of this is simply polymerizing or growing a polymer brush on an ingentine oxide surface. ITO is actually a very rough surface. And uh, the quality depends, of course, on the company or the preparation. So what we've done, is we have grafted these polymers, and as you can see here, a big change in the roughness, so from a very rough ITO to a smooth ITO, but more importantly, that ITO contained a whole transporting material, which makes them useful for efficient things like LED devices, so in this case, by doing this treatment, we are able to make a low-voltage device 
or in terms of improving the performance of a photovoltaic device, we match the performance of PDOT PSS, which is a very common whole transport barrier in bulk rejection devices. Now what's interesting is if we carry this chemistry on patterns. So here, for example, is a, a microcontact printed pattern about 60 to 100 microns. Uh, we can do it uh, 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 up to several hundred microns. But then we can selectively deposit, for example, this blue light emitting uh, polymer by cyclic voltammetry as shown here to produce clean patterns. If you do, don't, do, don't do this type of assembly carefully, you get a big mess. But by doing this on a site selective electro deposition, we can get this very nice pattern. Uh, in fact, we carried it all the way to the uh, SPM level. So in this case, what we did is we simply applied a bias voltage on a spin cast film or a Langmuir blodgett deposited film of a precursor polymer. It could be as simple as polyvinyl carbazole, or we've designed different types of precursor polymers like polythiophene. So you can start writing your patterns. And depending on the voltage, the residence time, you can control the height, the width, and the uh, complexity of the patterns. And since then, we've reported uses for this to make uh, uh, worm-like memory devices and sensors. One of the work that we did back then was to use polyelectrolyte layer by layer deposition to make very controlled film thicknesses. So I had my student uh, Cheng Yu Wang to synthesize this uh, two polymers. It's a polyvinyl pyridine with a carbazole group, a polyacrylic acid with a carbazole group. So you alternate this layer by layer by layer by layer, okay? So you see this increase in the UVVs absorption as you go to thicker films. We then electropolymerize or cross, cross link these carbazole groups to form a polycarbazole. Cyclic voltammetry, oxidation uh, waves, the oxidation starts at 0.6 volts. And then finally, we utilize electro nano patterning that I've shown you earlier. So we can make lines, we can make different types of squares, different heights. Uh, I asked my student uh, then to make different types of circuit-like looking patterns. And one night as I was about to go home from my office, he showed me this pattern. He showed, you know, why did you make a heart pattern? I did not ask you to do that. You know, we're, we're a lab here, we're serious. We're supposed to make these test patterns. And he just told me that he liked doing it. So I noticed that they like working every night. And then three weeks, they came to my office and they said they want to get married, okay? So that's a really nice work. Their work even made it to the cover page of Macromolecules. So I just want to let you know that there's lab in my lab or lab in Macromolecules, something like that. Okay, fourth example. Can we use colloids, particles, to make array patterns? Uh, this is quite well known. Our take on this is we can take this emulsion polymerized polystyrene particles, make a monolayer array. Since these are perfect spheres, you can get a hexagonally packed structure uh, by AFM or SEM, clear. And then we use the interstitial spaces around this pattern to do electrochemistry. So we electropolymerize these conducting polymers, in this case polypyrrole, and we got this nice beehive light structures, half dome, full dome. In fact, the full dome are capsules. We can remove them or shave them and we can produce these hollow shell capsules after we have removed the core uh, polystyrene, which is THF. Well, another interesting thing is we can, again, make these patterns here. We can deposit this bifunctional carbazole group and make these conducting polymer lines. These conducting polymers, as seen here, can be deposited by cyclic voltammetry. But since the middle or the core is still hollow or, or uh, ITO surface or uh, gold surface, we can grow another thing inside those. Uh, um. So what we have here is then uh, we were able to fill the holes with polymer brushes by grafting an ATRP initiator and then growing polynipam such that we have 
an array of conducting polymers with a grafted polymer brush in the middle. So it's a binary composition, and using conducting AFM, we were able to distinguish the conducting polymer layer from the non-conducting polymer brush. However, we can also grow it differently. We can grow the polymer brush on top of the arrays by using macro initiators of a conducting polymer where you can have an ATRP or a RAF initiator or even a metathesis uh, um, initiator. And then, as you can see here, the sequence is that we graph the initiators and then grow the polymer brush. So you see a rough looking array or beehive array. And we've since done that on those two other types of samples or uh, since again, the middle part is accessible for grafting another polymer, we then grafted uh, an ATRP initiator and then grew a polymer brush. So this is a way of having a ternary composition, two polymer brushes and a conducting polymer on a single surface in highly patterned surface. Now let me skip uh, this part here because what I did is show that we can do MIP on these surfaces. Uh, and then just showed our recent work was essentially trying to pattern cowpea mosaic viruses or CPMV uh, to deposit on surfaces in a nice array format as shown here where you can see the viruses going around the periphery of the pattern rather than going inside or in the middle of the pattern. And in fact, we can remove or shave these constructs and use them as cluster bombs uh, for viral therapeutic agents or packaging of these uh, harmless viruses. I think I have uh, time to go over the last uh, example here. The last example is how we have utilized this technique uh, of uh, polymer brushes on graphene nanoparticles. So of course we've heard a lot of graphene and I'm not going to uh, go over this introduction again, except that with a Janus nanoparticle, essentially the term for looking back at the past or looking forward to the future, a Janus nanoparticle is two-phase. You can do this on different types of particles, this or spherical particles. The bottom line is, is it possible to have a Janus nanoparticle graphene oxide? So in this case, uh, this graphene oxide, which is derived from solution dispersion methods, can be grafted with polymer brushes on both sides, okay? So simply by tethering, let's say, uh, this initiator and then growing um, a PMMA brush. Or what we can do is put this as a pickering emulsion type of interaction or armoring a sphere such that you can do the chemistry only on one side and then remove them after the polymerization to end up with a Janus graphene oxide. So in this case, the uh, starting with the analysis of this uh, um, co completely covered graphene oxide, you can see that the polymerization was done cleanly by ATRP. And then we uh, confirmed the grafting polymerization simply by looking at the uh, dispersion on selective solvents. So it disperses well on some and not, but by AFM, it's clear that we can look at these particles and confirm uh, the grafting of the brushes, uh, in fact, using XPS and SIMS later. SIMS technique later, as I'll show you, that this works so. So for example, using time of flight SIMS, we can confirm this species present, uh, where we can differentiate with mapping the presence of PMMA on both sides of the graphene oxide um, as well. Uh, here we, see, we, sh uh, we show that it's possible to make the Janus nanoparticle by using them as an emulsion type of uh, functionalization. So as you can see here, this emulsion was crafted with graphene oxide nanosheets and then you can do only one chemistry and then remove the um, remove the uh, uh, grafted polymer uh, graphene oxide and do some further analysis. So here we can see that AFM is key because uh, the thickness is twice that of a uh, completely functionalized graphene oxide versus half to that of the material. And then we can observe that the um, morphology is different based on the phase, amplitude, and lateral force images. However, we had to use Langmuir-Blodgett techniques because with Langmuir-Blodgett techniques, we can pick up 
uh, the two nanosheets differently and then analyze their wetting behavior. And as you can see here, uh, two types of wetting behavior based on a PMMA grafted surface or a non-PMMA grafted surface, which is quite hydrophilic. And then, of course, the data from top seams confirmed that the presence of the uh, polymer on both sides or one side can be observed by monitoring the uh, bromine group, which is the end group for the ATRP, which is present on both sides or only on one side. Okay, so with that, I'm ready to conclude. What I've shown you is that it's possible to go molecular, macromolecular, uh, where we can do a lot of chemistry on templated and pattern surfaces. There's a convergence of function on going from a bottom-up approach uh, from nan or nanoscopic to macroscopic. However, there's a convergence of design from macroscopic all the way to the nanoscopic. I've shown that patterning, nanopatterning, and templating is possible in a hierarchical manner and emphasizing the importance of surface probe microscopy and a number of characterization methods such as TOF, SIMS, SEM, XPS, and so on. I've also shown that nature, of course, inspires us to make various designs and that it's possible to uh, have a high throughput production of Janus nanoparticles using the emulsion technique that we described. So with that, I'd like to thank you and be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, thank you, Professor Adwinkler, for this very nice overview of the broad range of activities. Uh, I'm sure there are some questions. Yeah, thank you very much for the very nice talk. Um, I have a question concerning the, the wetting properties of your fake lotus leaf uh, substrate. Um, and you showed us that from zero degrees to 40 degrees, it has this transition uh, from, from super uh, well, hydrophilic to, to super hydrophobic. Um, and can you tell us what, what is happening in between? Is this a smooth transition or is there some kind of like uh, step in between? Like Good question. So uh, we did this study basically to, to prove that, you know, 15 degrees C is enough to make that very big whopping 150 in contact angle measurement. What we did not do, and like what you said, would be interesting is to look at the intermediate steps. If uh, we heat it at 37, at 38, or look at it at 30, do we get intermediate wetting? And my assumption is that the uh, hydrogen bonding, of course, uh, driving the uh, intramolecular interaction within the polynipram has a big role to follow. One of the uh, tests that I've seen in the past is they actually use salts or other types of dopant molecules to mediate that intramolecular hydrogen bonding. But yes, that's a study that needs to be made to look at the characteristics on the uh, morphology or wetting behavior at various temperatures. Any more questions? Um, I have still one. Um, I mean, you very nicely showed this trick of uh, using colloids as templates uh, for your polymerization. Um, you also mentioned that you can cover them completely and then still remove the core. Um, does just the solvent diffuse in and then the, the, poly uh, the monomers uh, or polymers diffuse out or does it really break open when you do this? Correct, correct. So uh, all the patterns that I've shown you, we first remove the core, which is polystyrene. So you can use THF as a mm -hmm. solvent to uh, leach them out. But since the electropolymerization is an insoluble part to THF, it's preserved. So after we have removed the core, then we start shaving them off. But you're right, I think a, a good or uh, interesting differentiation is removing them after uh, they would have uh, been removed from the surface. Yeah. So. Thank you. Any more questions? If that's not the case, uh, we can switch over to the coffee break and we will be back for the next presentation in 10 minutes. Let's thank, thank you. you. Thank you.